No one showed up. Yeah, but, um... It's okay. Next Monday we can all do the same thing again. Yeah. Oh, and that's the only world. At least somebody <laughs> problem because it's clearly getting so, some of the Possibly. That'll be rough. Cool, Tracy, hi! This talk is literally just pretty pictures. No, no, um, it was fun. It was, when it showed up, it was actually just all, the image was all wrong. And just like the guy said before, it's it's not working. Oh, okay. so I don't know. Do you know what happens here? No, there's a projector right here. This is the backup plan. I don't know where Jason is. So this projector was brought in, I guess, for, as a backup plan because this projector doesn't accept the guy who was teaching this class right before we came in, so the projector was broken, and indeed it is the case. I tried plugging it in, and it has this, like, yeah, that's right, we could all just turn around. 
Um, but where did Jason just go? Okay. Cool. Yeah. I recently moved to Illinois from Berkeley, where I was a postdoc, uh, and I really miss California. It's a great day to be in California. You guys are so lucky. Um, so I'm a nuclear engineering professor, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the modeling and simulation that I do in nuclear engineering. Now, I know you are uh, mechanical and aerospace engineers, so we'll mostly talk about some of the basics so you understand my problems, and then I'll just show you a lot of pretty pictures and tell you how I got there. Um, it'll be pretty fun. And if you have uh, any questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Um, so I do a lot of things. Um, I'm involved a lot with scientific computing education work, um, like The Hacker Within, um, as well as Software Carpentry. I wrote a book related to effective computation in physics and the physical sciences. Um, and I'm currently involved in the National Center for Supercomputing Applications, but I'm not going to talk about any of those things. I am going to talk about the research that I do. Um, so these are pieces of code that I write and my graduate students and postdocs work on. Um, and this is the logo for my research group. So we'll just dive right in to some of that work. Um, but basically, the, you can think of my work as attempting to gain insight at both the very, very high level in nuclear engineering questions around how we produce power, in particular in the United States, with fission reactors, um, but including also other reactors, and um, like including fusion type and whatnot, but mostly f fission reactors in the United States. And I'm also interested in the very detailed um, physics in high fidelity simulation of nuclear reactors on the inside at the atomic scale. Okay, So what I try to do is connect these two things. So at one level, you have this global scale nuclear fuel cycle analysis. And now, the nuclear fuel cycle is the process by which nuclear fuel starts in the ground, ends up in a reactor, maybe gets recycled, and eventually either ends up on a cooling pad somewhere next to a reactor, or hopefully someday in the ground. Uh, how many of you know how much power in the United States like, how much of the electricity pumping through these lights is generated by nuclear power? Anyone? 10%? Higher? Lower. Higher or lower than 10%? Okay, I got some higher. Higher or lower than 15%? Higher. It's actually 20%, which is pretty good. Um, so you guys seem to have a good idea of that. So I'm interested in what kinds of things we can do to improve the way we treat fuel. Um, either in the front end, as it goes into advanced reactor types, or on the back end, when we consider reprocessing it and utilizing that fuel a little bit more. And I'm also interested in modeling and simulation of nuclear reactors. So I try to use some of the insights that I gain from investigating the coupled multiphysics, that is neutronics and thermal hydraulics, which I'll get into, inside nuclear reactors. And I try to use that dominant physics in analyses of the global scale around producing that 20% of electricity. Um, and some of those analyses at the global scale can feed back into drivers for reactor designs that might improve global scale impacts. So this is the kind of thing that I do. So I have sort of two types of work, and we'll talk about both of them. Um, and these are my graduate students and undergraduates who are working with me. I have a postdoc 
um, who's done some multi-physics work recently. He's very productive, as well as two graduate students and a few, a few undergrads. Um, so let's start with the basics. I'm going to rush through a nuclear physics class so you guys all understand how fission reactors work. Um, and you're all going to get just enough of the variables to understand one set of equations that I'll then talk about. Okay. So this is fission. You throw a neutron at a fissile atom like uranium-235, and it causes a fission. And fission is just to split apart. So it splits apart into two pieces, probably-ish. And uh, it spits out some heat. That's that burst there in this diagram. And more neutrons, possibly two, possibly three, something like that. And ideally, that uranium atom is not alone in the material. Ideally, there are other uranium atoms, and the neutrons that came off of the first reaction may cause a fission in other uranium atoms. Now, you can see some of the neutrons don't cause a fission in those uranium atoms. Ideally, um, in a nuclear reactor, so we call that flux of neutrons phi, and it depends on a lot of things. The amount of neutrons that you're seeing in a chain reaction like this depends on the energy of those neutrons, depends on where they are in the material, what angle they impact the, the um, uh, uranium atom at, um, and the temperature of the atom itself. Um, and in fact, you know, R, of course, is split into three variables. So we're really talking about a seven-dimension seven probability here. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind that I'm dealing with these seven dimensions. Um, but uh, we talk about the probability that a fission is going to occur uh, if a neutron hits a uranium atom. We talk about this in terms of cross-section. So I say the probability that a neutron is going to cause a fission in a uranium-235 atom is this sigma. And it's a cross-section in units of area, which is kind of interesting. But it's just a probability. And another probability that we're playing with is what fissions what fission products result. Uh, and if you fission a uranium atom, you get this red curve. And this is an atomic number here. You've got the percentage likelihood that it's going to end up being that, and, uh, that atom. So you have some peaks here with strontium, zirconium, technetium. Um, and you have some peaks here at the end with cesium and uh, iodine. And these are the most common fission products, the most common results of that fission. So the two halves they don't seem to break in half, do they? They break in one-third and two-third size chunks, so keep that in mind. So we call this uh, the yield, um, and it depends on the isotope that we're talking about uh, fissioning. And there are 3,000 of those possible isotopes, something like 3,000. Uh, and this is a plot of all of them um, in terms of their uh, activity. So. Generally speaking, we're talking about a very large number of atoms. Each one of these squares is one of the possible things that could result from a fission in a reactor. Uh, so we call that I. All right, so I'm giving you all these variables. I is the isotope that might come out, um, or perhaps the isotope that got fissioned. All of these things come together to create a cross-section, this probability of the uh, particular reaction. This is a plot of various cross-sections in U-235. So this includes the fission cross-section, this purple line, the probability in what I called Barnes, this area, um, that a fission will occur. And it occurs over this huge range of energies. And it gets very confusing in the middle where there are these nuclear resonances. Right? But in addition to this, there's different kinds of cross-section. Maybe it just bounces off. right? Um, or, and, or, and it has an elastic type of collision. Maybe it gets absorbed, and that's a more inelastic type of collision. All right, so all of these things um, are determined experimentally, and they're just probabilities. So, yes, Asley? Is inelastic different in Inelastic is, includes more than just fusion. So absorption for just a brief time, for example, and then kicking off some other product is... Yeah, so inelastic includes many, many, many things. And so, like, U-235 doesn't ever really do, like, give off a fusion-type reaction. So, yeah, but it does absorb sometimes an extra neutron. Uh, right, so these are actually just separated out. So it captures part of inelastic in this graph, but they're plotted separately. <laughs> Good question. So, okay. In any case, this is a kind of 
energy-based, uh, this is the dependence on energy that we're talking about in terms of these, uh, these equations. So keep in mind this large magnitude of energies. All of this is based on various things about nuclear structure and whatnot. You know, but why am I telling you all this, right? So there's, there's various parts of nuclear structure that determine the likelihood of all this, but we just capture it into this one probability number, you know, that's a graph along uh, energy. But why am I telling you all this? Um, there's all this physics that goes into it and whatnot, um, you know, and we combine this nuclear structure and experiments in order to get nuclear data sets, right? And so I do modeling and simulation. I don't do experiments. I do, um, I use this kind of data to ask questions about nuclear reactors. So this kind of data is very complicated. It's seven dimensional. It's got these, you know, some of these um, dimensions, like the isotope dimension is 3,000 isotopes big. You know, the energy dimension crosses all of these magnitudes, et cetera. And it's all representing the kind of nuclear structure that nuclear physicists worry about, okay? We determine these kinds of cross sections in really cool experiments, like at the lead slowing down spectrometer um, or at the Lance detector where you put some sample in the middle and you use a ton of photomultiplier tubes and you ask, what's the cross-section? What, how likely was it that this fissioned or had a capture type of uh, cross-section? Now, that was a cartoon. They actually look like this, right? Um, but I don't do any of those experiments. For me, like, nuclear data is for simulations. The kind of simulations that I run are both stochastic and deterministic. So this is the kind of mesh that I might design. Uh, so this is a mesh of a reactor that we were looking at um, that is... This green part is a graphite reflector. The pink part is just a fluoride lithium beryllium salt. The little spheres here are a graphite uranium fuel type called a trisopebble. Um, and there are thousands of them in this device. And this is a very simple pebble bed fluoride salt cooled high temperature reactor. This is not what we produce power with in the United States. This is a cool advanced reactor design that I'm interested in. And in order to determine how it will behave in various severe scenarios, I use these nuclear data sets. So I'm telling you about these nuclear data sets so that I can now tell you what kinds of methods we use to, uh, to turn those nuclear data sets into insights about nuclear reactors. So we use Monte Carlo methods. How many of you have used a Monte Carlo method for something at some point? Right. Monte Carlo was invented for nuclear engineering. Monte Carlo was invented just for the neutron transport problem in the Manhattan Project, unfortunately. Um, but Jonathan Neumann and uh, Enrico Fermi and all of them uh, decided that this kind of probabilistic representation of the types of possible reactions that a neutron might have in a material, that is the, that is the way that you need to then model all transport because there are too many variables, there are too many dimensions. What you should do is run histories of a single neutron through a system and ask questions about the likelihood of each event and continue those histories through a simulation, a simulated truth. And so Monte Carlo methods kind of spin the wheel in the probability. They sample each probability distribution um, to determine the, likely, the most likely types of reactions. Um, we have deterministic methods where we solve our neutron diffusion equation. It looks a lot like a typical diffusion equation, but it, it addresses these uh, neutron transport properties. Um, we sometimes combine Monte Carlo and deterministics to speed one up or make one more accurate. Um, and, you know, there's other keywords in our universe, acceleration schemes, adjoint methods, etc. We use lattice codes for this. Um, and we have to do all kinds of, um, all kinds of data processing to those, uh, that original nuclear data in order to correctly uh, simulate. Uh, this kind of stuff. And so the kinds of things we do is we sometimes discretize the energy. So instead of treating that cross-section probability graph, which was like a line with all these resonant frequencies and one other line, um, instead of treating that as a continuum, we break up the energy into bins, right? And you can imagine that you might not need as much resolution of the bins uh, in the very flat parts of that graph but you might need very good resolution in the resonances, and you might need to have very good ways of integrating those bumps in the middle of that cross-section plot that I showed you. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that we do. We try to discretize angle. So I told you that the cross-section probabilities depend on the angle of impact. So we also discretize those with, with angular quadratures. Like, you guys probably use quadratures in various applications, even as mechanical and aerospace engineers. Yeah, no, for some angular integration work. Your professors are watching. You should nod. 
<laughs> All right, so my current work right now, um, I'm very interested in molten salt reactor designs, both solid-fueled reactor designs and also liquid-fueled reactor designs, where the fuel is dissolved into the salt, um, and the salt is both the coolant and the fuel. Uh, it's very interesting, actually, and I won't go into the, the physics of it, but basically it makes recycling a little easier. Okay. So right now, a typical nuclear reactor has uranium oxide fuel pins, so long cylinders of uranium oxide, which is kind of like a ceramic, a very dense ceramic. And those pins are cooled by uh, boiling water right, in a pressurized vessel. Now molten salt, very, very hot salt, does not have to be pressurized um, because it's not going to boil uh, because you have to get up to pretty high temperatures for salt to boil. Uh, and you can move that liquid into a reprocessing scheme outside of the reactor. So in this, in this scheme, you have some fuel salt. You have various structures for slowing down the neutrons. We won't get into that. Um, and you can reprocess. Um, well, you can reprocess over here, and you use heat exchangers. Of course, we're creating electricity, so pretty much all, most electricity other than sort of solar photovoltaics just spins a turbine at some point, right? That's where our turbine is, is you create some heat, and uh, you spin a turbine. All right. Uh, some of the work we're doing right now is simulating an MSBR. So this is a molten salt breeder type reactor. You don't have to know what a breeder is really, but uh, it's more efficient use of, uh, of the nuclear fuel. Uh, this is a design from the 70s. We actually ran a molten salt reactor in the 70s, um, and this was an advancement on that design. Uh, we ran it out in the Idaho desert, like we've done with many, many cool reactors. Um, and so I have a graduate student who's putting together a large Monte Carlo simulation of this reactor. Right? And so you start with the mesh. And in this geometry, you have fuel salt, this yellow, uh, and it's contained by various channels of graphite. Now you need the graphite for the nuclear physics. I won't go into it too much, but basically it's more likely for a nuclear fission to happen if the neutrons are going pretty slowly. And we slow them down by letting them run into graphite molecules um, which tend to slow them down because of this size. Um, so we like to put graphite in nuclear reactors to slow down our neutrons. because They start out pretty fast. And so in order to make that fission happen in the second or third generation, we slow them down. All right, so you've got a solid pink stuff and liquid fuel in the middle. And this is like, again, a fluoride lithium type salt with uranium dissolved in it. Uh, and this is just a typical nuclear grade graphite. Okay. Uh, this is another of the cells. So this is just a zoom in on some of the channels in this reactor design. So if you're looking from the top, um, all of the purple here is graphite, and all of the yellow is fuel. Um, and so this fuel salt goes through this like very carefully designed sunburst sort of pattern to create fissions in a somewhat flat manner. And so my uh, graduate student created this like very complicated mesh you know, because these aren't just boxes, they're kind of quirky boxes. Um, he created this very complicated mesh and ran neutron histories through it to ask questions around its behavior. Um, and, you know, he tried to get very detailed matching between this old drawing and um, the current mesh. And he's done a very good job. And then he ran these, these neutrons. And this is the result. It's a very pretty type of result. You see a lot of fissions in these central lard um, channels. Uh, and that's, that's where the control rods would drop in. Um, great. Yeah, so I'm about to go there. So there's two color scales on this plot, just to confuse you. Um, the main color scale that you're interested in is going to go from red to yellow. And so there are some that are on this warm path, and especially in, these, um, in, the, in the fuel channels, right? So between the blocks and in the center of the blocks. And that yellow is number of fissions. So it's sort of like the, number of, the amount of neutron flux uh, that you're getting. And the blue to white, you see, is mostly in the graphite part. And that is the amount of scattering, more or less. So that's the amount of slowing down in the graphite that you see. Now, this is a really common way to plot things in nuclear engineering because we're interested in those two phenomena at the same time. Um, so it makes a really pretty picture, uh, but it's ultimately um, hundreds of thousands of neutrons uh, model. This is a plain view 
Um, again, just the geometry where the purple is graphite and the yellow is salt. Um, and then you get the same red to yellow, blue to white um, fissions. So you see there's mostly fissions in the middle. That's what we want. That's the reality. And mostly scattering in the reflectors. So now that's all great, uh, all well and good. Um, what do we do with that? All right, well, so that didn't tell us really much. It just tells us, like, where the fissions are happening and where, where the scattering is happening. So we know the steady state of this reactor. But what's really interesting is what happens when you say pull a control rod, um, especially in these kinds of creative reactor designs. This particular reactor design has a tendency to just shut itself down um, in the event of a severe reactivity insertion, so something where you pull a control rod. Right? Um, so let's talk about what do I mean by reactivity, uh, and then we'll talk about what kinds of uh, other methods we use to solve that problem. So I've talked about Monte Carlo. We solve these like, kind of big meshes and get core behavior um, out of that. In this case, uh, we're going to talk about dynamic solutions. So we call this reactor kinetics. So again, we've got this fission. And recall, there's this cross-section that determines the probability of that. Um, but it's not the whole story. We want to keep the reactor typically where the multiplication from um, one neutron to the next generation of neutrons is one. So that's not the case in this image, right? Because uh, you see there's like one fission here, and then it's like a whole bunch over there. What you really want is just enough neutrons to be produced that you're getting the same amount of fissions all the time, all the way across the reactor. If you get too many fissions, then you can see it would blow up. Um, and, and you get very nonlinear behavior if you deviate from just a neutron multiplication of one. All right. So we call K this neutron multiplication factor. This is what you may have heard of as criticality. Right? A nuclear reactor is critical when it's going just fine, oh, which is a bit odd in terms of vocabulary. But... We don't want it to go super critical. We especially don't want it to go super critical very quickly. Um, we call that prompt supercriticality. Um, and we don't want to go subcritical because that's boring. It just shuts down. OK. Um, cool. Oh, but then, so that, that change, this deviation from K, the deviation from flatness in terms of the neutron population is called reactivity. And we'll call that rho. Great. So rho depends on the cross-section, um, but in the context of the temperature of the, uh, of the isotopes, the, there are reactivity feedbacks that you can get just from changing the temperature. Okay, and that's sort of what this looks like. You maybe have some neutron population that results in a power P, you know, and maybe it's at K equals 1 or not, and that heats up the fuel. Okay? And maybe the fuel heats up other things, the graphite reflectors or everything else. All right, and then you come back, and every single one of those components that gets hotter, its cross-section changes. So I told you the probability of fission changes based on temperature. Um, indeed, that, that reactivity changes and feeds back um, because it, it has this dependence on temperature. And it changes the reactivity, and that changes then the power, it turns out. So we have a feedback loop. And if it's a power-to-temperature feedback loop in a nuclear reactor, you want power to go down when there's a divergence in temperature that goes up. So you want a negative feedback loop. Right? As temperature goes up, you know you're entering an accident scenario. Okay? Because you don't want it to get, to get so hot that you melt down. Right? So you guys have heard about melting down. Okay? You don't want it to do that typically. So um, generally speaking, you want a negative feedback loop. Okay. But note that there's this reactivity. To complicate this problem, it, some of the fission products, uh, those strontiums and iodines and cesiums and stuff that come out of the reaction on the other side of the fission, some of them are not very stable. And they tend, some tens of seconds later sometimes, to kick off an extra neutron. It turns out that that amount of time between the first prompt fission and that delayed neutron kickoff by some of the uh, fission products that amount of time is just enough for nuclear power to be useful to humans. It's on human timescales where we can control the reaction. So we can use some of this delay to shut down the reactor before the feedback loop goes wild. So these, this is called a delayed neutron precursor. It's the precursor to a delayed neutron. And um, without it, we wouldn't be able to control nuclear reactors. 
right? But it has a very nonlinear behavior to this dynamic problem, okay? Because you have a delay, and you have to calculate then this kinetics problem, all right? Um, and we call a fraction of these delayed neutron precursors beta, and we call their decay constant lambda, and you get all of these things that I've just described to you, power p, and you know, the delayed neutron precursors, and t, and all this stuff, um, the temperature, and we get reactor kinetics. And we can assume that a lot of this happens in a point. But what you basically get, and I'm not going to explain this, but you get a, a very tightly coupled partial differential equation set. You get this set of partial differential equations where you have to solve for the power, but the power feeds back. So you're solving for power way up here, and you've got rho in the power equation. But you're calculating rho um, as a change in power, and rho depends on t, right? And so any change in t down here is going to come back through rho and change the power. And then the power causes a change in t, the temperature, because more power means more heat. Right? And so these two equations are really tightly coupled in this system. Uh, and so it's a, it's a fairly stiff equation uh, set, a stif stiff set of PDEs. Um, and in order to solve it, I use this cool tool that was created at Idaho National Lab uh, called Moose, which is capable of ingesting large matrices like that of partial differential equations. And it uses something called a Jacobian free Newton Krylov solver. You don't have to know what that means. But basically, it solves all of these partial differential equations all at once on a single mesh, rather than separating the physics out um, and solving one set of physics that are on a certain uh, set of PDEs and then solving the other set of physics and trying to couple between them like on each time step. It does it actually all at once. Very clever applied math. Uh, if any of you are interested in applied math, I think there's a lot, a lot of things that it impacts. Uh, but generally speaking, this framework is a finite element type framework. So this, is, this is something. Um, how many of you have done finite element stuff so far? Yeah, you're mechanical engineers and stuff. Of course you have. Um, so anyway, if you can describe the mesh on which the physics happens, and you can describe the PDEs um, of the physics, we call those physics kernels in Moose. Um, Moose can ingest those things, and it scales really nicely. To up to, it strongly scales up to 10,000 cores, actually. Um, and uh, it's completely open source, which uh, is really important to me. Uh, so. You can use this kind of framework to simula simulate both neutronics, which happens at this very, very, very um, small, both time and spatial scale, with something like thermal hydraulics, which happens at a completely different scale. You know, you're talking more like in the context of centimeters when you're talking about thermal hydraulics. You're talking more in the context of seconds rather than, you know, angstroms and, uh, and you know, nanoseconds. So, um, what we've done is we've created a molten salt app within this Moose framework that defines those PDEs appropriately for this molten salt reactor concept. Ask the question, what happens in an accident in a molten salt reactor where the fluid that contains the fuel is actually moving and may in fact be outside of the reactor in the heat exchanger, for example, when those delayed neutrons get kicked off, right? And so if if the fluid of the fuel is out in that heat exchanger, when the delayed neutrons get kicked off, then you get this huge flux of neutrons in your heat exchanger. Do we want that? No, not really. So um, we're investigating some of those sort of details about this design with this thing called Moltres, which is a uh, Navier-Stokes multi-group diffusion and kinetics uh, code like app for um, the Moose framework. And Moose can do anything, not just nuclear engineering. It's just finite element framework. Um, you have to add your own physics. It's like a BYO physics situation. Um, anyway, so we added some Navier Stokes and multi group neutron diffusion and some kinetics. Uh, the rest of this is kind of meaningless to the rest of you guys, but uh, we couple the neutron power and the salt temperature and the flow. Right? So this is pretty new. Um, people have done it before in different ways, but uh, we should be getting very interesting results. Um, and here's some of them. So, right now, um, you can see in this case, so what we have here is thermal neutrons. We have fast neutrons here and thermal neutrons here. So they're different energy groups of neutrons, different types of energy. And the hot, the red um, is a high flux of those neutrons. The blue is a low flux of those, those neutrons. And we appropriately see some heat in the middle. Now, um, this diagram is a little hard to see in this context, but half of it is the reflector and half is the fuel channel and it's axially 
symmetric boundary conditions. And down here at the bottom is the temperature, which we do expect to be hottest at the top, at the outlet, which is how we then produce power with it, right? You want the out, oh, also the, flu the fluid flows up in this reactor. That, that's easier then to understand why the heat, not only from raising, but because of the movement of the fuel. Um, and you can see those delayed neutron precursors, those types of um, precursors that kick off a delayed neutron as they flow through the fuel. This is the shortest lived precursor, and it doesn't get very far through the reactor before it starts to decay. So its highest uh, um, concentration is up here. Whereas the longest lived delayed neutron precursor for normal operation is all the way at the outlet at its peak amount. So because it's not decaying very quickly, it's it's very likely probably to make it to the heat exchanger. All right. So um, I was going to dance you through a couple, a couple other things, but I will just, uh, I'll just show you a few. Well, okay, so I have this other nuclear fuel cycle simulation framework. Um, that was all Moltres. That was like, so I've shown you some Monte Carlo, some deterministic, um, and this is this kind of high-level stuff. So if I have some great reactor design that, uses fuel in a, in a more efficient way like the molten salt reactor does, you know, maybe I want to ask questions around um, how we might use that in our, in our current power context. You know, I won't, uh, I won't bore you too much, but in this context, and you can see my slides later actually, but um, we ask questions around how much mass is flowing where? Wait, I guess I have until five. Wait, when does this end? Okay, so I should probably stop talking in five minutes. Okay, <laughs> um, so we might ask questions around, you know, if we change the type of reactor we use in the United States this year, what are the isotopes that are present in the repository 500 years from now? Uh, and that's a very complicated problem, and you have to really think about this in terms of the individual facilities that are deployed. You know, and so these questions around mass flow um, are really about mass flow through large number of discrete facilities. There are about 100 reactors in the United States that produce power for electricity. And that, could do, that creates 20% of your power. So 100 reactors is a lot less than 20% of your power created by coal. But anyway, um, generally speaking, it can also ask questions around cost and economics and some of the sort of questions around system robustness if there's an accident um, in one of the reactors. Can the other reactors come online and stuff like that? Uh, OK. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other simulators, but we've improved upon it. Um, I will, I'm going to bounce through this a little bit. And we've, we've mostly improved upon other simulators for this kind of work by being really open. Most of them are produced by the national labs and are behind closed doors. Uh, you have to get a license for them. Um, sometimes you have to pay for that license. Also, uh, we've tried to make sure that um, this code is fairly usable for a wide range of user sophistication, we'll call it. Um, and it's extensible, so we've created it in a really computationally modular fashion. So just like Moose, you can sort of BYO physics, right? You can come in and say, well, this is my favorite reactor design, and Cyclist, this is what this um, piece of code is called, Cyclist. Um, you can sort of come in and say, well, here's a, here's a medium fidelity model of how my reactor transmutes fuel from fresh fuel to spent fuel. Put it in your simulation where you would usually put a light water reactor. And tell me how it changes the, the situation in the world. Um, anyway, so, uh, you know, it's, it's designed, again, so that there's a framework where there's a kernel and some, some cleverness, but it's an agent-based simulation. So we have some models of what facilities and regions and institutions might be like in this sort of broader scheme, um, but they just fit into the API, and the API manages communication between them. Um, again, I said it was open. There's a bunch of these pieces that are being BYO'd, right? So a lot of people are bringing in pieces, um, various facilities into this uh, universe. I'm going to, okay, so here I'll explain the algorithm because that's why I'm here is to talk to you guys about what kinds of algorithms I use. Okay. Um, one thing that we do, so we want to track all the isotopes in a system of hundreds of reactors that produce thousands of isotopes each at different uh, yields for hundreds of years. Right? It's a lot of isotopes. Um, and so we've had to be very clever so that our database doesn't just blow up on the output. All right? And so we've done some very clever things to deduplicate isotopic tracking through this system. Um, but generally speaking, uh, we keep track of when certain things have been created. And we also have to decay those materials through time because 
nuclear material doesn't just sit around, right? When you're interested in uh, fission products, they're often decaying into other isotopes at a somewhat fast uh, pace. Um, it's somewhat customizable, and uh, I won't go into these other things. They're a little confusing for a non-nuclear audience. Um, <coughs> what we basically say, there's actors, the facilities, and there's a communications uh, framework. And with those two things, you can create something like SimCity. And this is effectively SimCity for the nuclear industry. Um, there's, you can imagine some facility might create material, and some source of material, or maybe it requests material from the simulation, or it requests material and then it turns it into something else, i.e. it's a reactor, and it spits that, that material back out into the simulation. And so with that, you can have a very simple set of definitions of your facilities, and you can rely on the communications framework that Cyclist gives you, and you can have very, uh, very complicated simulations, even for these very simple uh, fuel cycles. Uh, forgive me while I bounce past some of the... Um, so this is basically how you set up one of these situations. Um, it's, a, it's what's called a multi-commodity transportation formulation of a uh, linear program. I don't have time to go into that here. I'm happy to answer questions about it. Um, but basically what it means is that we can dynamically exchange resources based on a set of rules. So for example, you can go from a situation where you don't recycle fuel and lots of it goes to the repository, or maybe you send just some of the spent fuel to the repository, or you can say that nothing coming out of the light water reactor is waste. You just say like, no, we don't let it all be called waste. You try to separate all of it and then it'll come back through um, the simulation. So with a single change, in the input file saying like, yes, you can make spent fuel or no, you can't. This reactor, um, this whole simulation will then change from being a recycling simulation to not being a recycling simulation. And then you can run lots of these and ask about how much plutonium is there in the system. This is a 10 reactor case. And in this case, you don't recycle any um, fuel. In this case, you recycle it once. Uh, in this case, you recycle it forever until you run out of plutonium. Um, and these are the kinds of toy problems that, you know, give examples of what Cyclist is capable of doing. You can also ask what happens um, if you try to transition from our current type of light water reactors to some kind of advanced reactors like a sodium cooled fast reactor. And you can ask questions then like, all right, as you transition, maybe you have to build more light water reactors to re create enough fuel uh, to feed the sodium cooled fast reactors. If you have rules about um, how they... Uh, how they ingest recycled fuel. This is the same simulation. Sorry to go through that one really quickly. Um, I'll just make one quick comment about how we know it's right. So lots of people did experiments to give us this data, but they're just, uh, and this is a very unfortunate experiment where this guy died, but um, unfortunately, um, there's sort of a dilemma where because these databases are really, really large, they are benchmarked against each other. So I told you there's thousands of isotopes and seven dimensions and all that stuff. Those databases I rely on for all of my simulations. Um, and it's hard to know what's right because actually there are a number of international standard databases in nuclear engineering. And it seems now that there's kind of a dilemma where some of them have compensating errors in a few of the probabilities. Um, this diagram is a little confusing, but basically what it shows you is that for a benchmark problem, you can switch pieces of the database and get a different answer um, because the databases are different in terms of those probabilities. That's explained by different interpretations of nuclear structure. Um, but I also do a lot of quality control. I check all the units in my code um, with a unit checking library so that I never mistake meters for centimeters. Um, I try to back up my files and use version control. I won't go into all this, but basically like I use Git. Um, I use version control. Um, I automate the creation of documentation for most of my code and the code in my group. And we spend a lot of time doing error detection. Um, so we have a test suite and continuous integration. So every night, all the tests on my code are run. Um, and I get an email if someone broke it. So uh, that's basically what I wanted to show you. I'm happy to answer questions. I know I had to kind of rush through this last part. Um, the projector kind of was slow. but. Uh, I know that was kind of a rush, and none of you really do in nuclear engineering, so I tried to show you a lot in a short amount of time. I hope it wasn't too overwhelming, and mostly some pretty pictures. Uh, okay. Uh-huh. 
The yeah, so that's the only thing that I the kinetics. What, what uh, about the three parts of the presentation? These guys? No, no. Oh, these? Oh, this is an advertisement. What is the top one? The top one? What is this? What this is the This is uh, the neutron diffusion equation. Um, this is actually just a Moose advertisement. Um, but, but ultimately, uh, this, this equation shows you um, angular flux of the neutrons as a dot product of this uh, non-angular flux. And then you have... Um, total cross-section as a function of position and total flux as a function of position and then you do this sort of angular distribution and you ask questions about the scattering versus this what's called the scattering kernel. But all of this, all of this is ideally to determine phi here, psi. Psi, yeah, so sometimes it's called phi because it's when it's angular. But anyway, so psi here, in this context, it's just looking for the flux of neutrons of a certain energy and position. So somewhere in your mesh of uh, geometry, this is a diffuse. How do they? Oh, so um, temperature and um, I mean it depends. So this is like <laughs> again, this is an advertisement. Um, but yeah, so temperature actually goes into this this uh, sigma. Um, and in this sigma, so both scattering and total cross-section are impacted by temperature. Um, and I honestly, like, this C is a generic type of equation, but, uh, you know, if you're, if you're just talking about the velocity of the fluid, then the temperature also couples into V, right? Uh-huh. Um, processes. So, like, uh, so they've run it on a whole bunch of different um, large HPC machines, and they've shown strong scaling up to 10,000 cores, but they actually scale really nicely above that, um, but they haven't done really careful analysis above that. Mostly their demonstration work um, for large coupled nuclear reactor uh, physics has been to get the answer and not to test the code. Uh, but they, they have tested the code up to this 10,000 core level. We've run it, so our Moltres simulations, we've run on 600 nodes at the Blue Waters cluster. So we're getting up there in terms of cores. Um, so yeah, I'm a Blue Waters professor at Illinois, so I have the benefit of being able to use a uh, lot of CPU nodes at this uh, Blue Waters high performance computing facility. And so Moose is very cool on that because it scales very nicely and we don't have to think about the parallelization at all. And for one more. Osley. Uh, who funds the development of Moose? Who funds the development of Moose? Pro primarily DOE. Um, the Department of Energy um, has a large nuclear engineering arm that initially drove the development of Moose. Questions around the coupling between materials and temperature and neutron flux drove the initial, um, the initial development of Moose. But now there are a lot of projects. Um, there's some geochemistry and rock geomechanics projects that use Moose, and there's some fundamental physics projects that use Moose. And so I think, you know, if you include the apps, there's a large array of funding. But the framework itself is at Idaho um, National Lab. Is, is primarily DOE funded. They got one of these R&D 100 awards a couple years ago. The lead developer got to shake the hand of Obama. It was pretty cool. All right, thanks everyone. Put too much stuff in there. Yeah. Too much, always. Oh, that's okay. Can we use this? Yeah. So let me. This is his adapter, I think.